In this video, we're going to continue our conversation about inverses in one-to-one. -one. So for this example, find three intervals in which f is one-to-one, -one, making each interval as large as possible. So to avoid any confusion here, I'm just going to put little arrows on these to indicate that it goes on forever so that I can include my infinity and negative infinity on my intervals. Okay, so to be one-to-one, -one, that means that it has to, every input has exactly Every output, sorry, has exactly one input. So, or graphically, it passes the horizontal line test. So here, I can see that that passes the horizontal line test. But then, as soon as I start getting below zero, notice that here we definitely don't pass the horizontal line test because we have this y value over here, whatever that might be. Um, let's call it y1. This has one, two, it will have three different inputs. And so this is not one-to-one. -one. So how do we make it one-to-one? -one? Um, we want to restrict the domain. So I'm going to use my highlighter here to say, well, I don't want this to be the case. So I'm just going to go and highlight this part now here, if I look, if you look at the yellow part, does if I'm just looking at that, does that pass the horizontal line test? Does every output, does every y value have exactly one x value? Yes. So we can say f of x is one to one. This is another way of writing one to one on. And so we're going to say negative infinity to negative one. So it's one to one there. And on, so what's another interval? Well, I guess I can separate it maybe by commas. So, so let me move this one. So what's another interval? So I'm gonna use a different color highlighter. So if I go, if I take the whole bottom here, that's not gonna be one to one, right? Because I'm gonna have that same Y1 is gonna then have two inputs. And so I'm not, I don't want the whole Thing, so I'm just going to take up until there. So then my second interval is going to be from negative 1 to, where does that end? Looks like at 1. So from negative 1 to 1. And then our last interval will be then from 1 to infinity. Now, I did put the arrows there. If those arrows were in there, then I will be looking for a solid dot or open dot to indicate that the function ends. So in your online homework platform, right, pay attention to that. Does the graph continue or does it have like a open dot or a solid dot? Or also it might be specified in the writing of the function that the domain is all real numbers. So kind of pay attention to that. So in this interval, the function will be one to one. So that means that I could have f inverse here for a restricted domain. And then a different, if inverse will look different on those other domains. So another property of inverses is that, let me say properties of f of x and f inverse of x. So if you have the function and its inverse, um, the composition of functions, so if I have f of f inverse of x, I'm gonna get x. So the inverse undoes the function. And the other way too, f inverse of f of x will give us x. And let me move that example down a little bit, which is the reason why we're able to say when you have the, if you have f of x equals x squared, right? And f inverse of x is the square root of x on zero to infinity, right, restricted domain, we can say f of f inverse of x. So in this case, it means f of f inverse, right? So inside of f, so for every x in f, we're going to put in f of x. So I'm going to take f inverse of x, and we're going to plug it in there. So then what does that look like? I'm going to have f inverse 
squared, which is really the square root of x squared, so you get x. And if you do it the other way around, if inverse of f of x, you'll get the same thing. So you should get x. All right, so let's try this other example. Find the inverse of the function f of x equals x squared minus 4x, 4x greater than or equal to 2. So notice that we have a restricted domain. Can you think of why that is? Why do we have a restricted domain? Then verify the relationship f inverse of f of x is x and f of f inverse is x. So why do we have a restricted domain? Because this is a quadratic, so we're going to have a parabola. So this is what the quadratic looks like. And based on the function, right, I have f of x equals x squared minus 4x. I can see what the intercepts are. This factors into x times x minus 4. So when you set that equal to 0, your x-intercepts are 0 and 4. So that's what these are. So that's 4 and 0 over here. Um, so when it says 4x greater than or equal to 2, so 2 must be that middle point here, which is the vertex. 2 comma something, right? You can plug it in there to see what it is. 2, two squared is 4 minus... 4 times 2 is 8, so 4 minus 8 is negative 4, so that's going to be our vertex. Um, so this function, it's a quadratic, right, parabola, so it is not 1 to 1. Um, but once I restrict the domain for when x is greater than or equal to 2, so that means I'm doing this part of the graph. And so if you ignore that one, then this will pass the horizontal line test, so it is 1 to 1 which means it has an inverse. When a function is not one-to-one, -one, it does not have an inverse. So this is one-to-one -one on the restricted domain. So I should say on two to infinity. Um, so it has an inverse. So how do we find the inverse? Then we do the method that we did above, right? So you have, so call it y, so say y equals x squared minus 4x, and then what are we going to do? We're going to switch x and y. Some people switch the x and y at the end, so some people solve for x and then switch the x and y's at the end, that's fine. It's, I like to switch the x and y's first so that I don't forget that at the end. So this is going to then look like x equals, right, I'm switching my x and y. So y becomes x and x has become y. And now we solve for y. So how do you solve for y here? Because you have y trapped into both. There's y squared and 4y. So the one thing, so be careful, you don't want to say x equals y minus 4 times y. I don't know why I did it backwards here. And say, oh, this equals x and that equals x. That only applies when you have 0 on one side. So be careful not to make that mistake. So because we want to isolate y, and you have two terms here and it looks like you can't, what we're going to do is we're going to complete the square. So we're going to complete the square. So if you haven't, if you don't remember how to complete the square, pause, go back, read on your book or pre-calculus book or intermediate algebra book, complete the square. Look that up so you can review it and then come back and finish the video. Um, so how do we complete the square? You look at the middle term or the, not the middle term, the y term. So the minus 4, we're going to take that coefficient and divided by 2, so I get negative 2, right, and then we square it. So negative 2 squared is 4, and so that's what we add to both sides to complete the square. So that means this process of completing the square is going to turn my equation into x equals y squared minus 4y and then I'm going to add, so let me move the x a little bit to give it room, I'm going to add the 4. 
so plus 4, but it's an equation, so whatever I do to one side, I must do to the other. And so this allows me to now complete the square, right? The idea of doing this is so that it completes the square, meaning this can be factored into a perfect square. So this is y minus 2 quantity squared equals x plus 4. So just refactor this. The, the quick trick is that whatever the answer is when you divide it by 2, so this negative 2, is what's going to go in the parentheses. So that's kind of like the quick way of factoring. And so now you have this quantity. And I'm just going to rewrite it here because I have that arrow there. Um, how do you get rid of the square? We're going to take the square root of both sides. And anytime you take the square root, you get that plus or minus, right? So you're going to have plus or minus the square root of x plus 4 equals y minus 2. And then... Now here's where we're going to look at our restricted domain. Because we said for x greater or equal to 2, that means that I have just the positive part of the parabola. And so when I take the square root of both sides and I get plus or minus, because of our restricted domain, we're only going to take the positive. And so let me make that note here. So because of restricted domain. So big if, big if here. If you had said x less than or equal to 2, then I will be taking the left side of this parabola. And so when I take the plus or minus, when I take the square root and get plus or minus, I would have chosen the negative um, square root of x plus 4. Because that's the side of the parabola that I will be working with. All right, so then this becomes the square root of just x plus 4 equals y minus 2. Add 2 to both sides, so y equals 2 plus the square root of x plus 4. All right, this 2 is not in a radical, so don't make the mistake combining with that 4. They're not like terms. So now this is our inverse. The inverse will be f inverse of x is... 2 plus the square root of x plus 4. If you prefer to write the variables first, then that's fine. You can say this is the square root of x plus 4 plus 2. Just make sure that it's clear that this plus 2 is outside of the radical. Sometimes you'll see me do this little kind of like a box at the end just to make sure to indicate that's where the radical ends and then everything else is outside the radical. Lots to unpack here, depending um, how strong your algebra skills are, right? We have domain restrictions, so visually, what does that mean? So I try to do a visual um, interpretation there. Um, algebraically, that's the plus or minus. And completing the square. So we are going to use completing the square a lot in calculus, not just in Calc 1, but also in Calculus 2. You use a lot of completing the square in the calculus too, actually. So it would be really important if this you were a little lost on doing this. I would really encourage you to review how to complete the square. And I I do have some videos from when I did my pre-calculus class online, so I'll try to post those in resources as well or underneath um, this video. And we'll do another example of finding inverses. All right, so let's try another example. Determine whether h of x equals x plus 1 over x minus 3 is 1 to 1. If it is, find the inverse. All right, so how do you determine if a function is 1 to 1? We've been talking about using the horizontal line test, right? Every output has exactly one input. But what if you don't know what the graph looks like? And in this class, um, calculus 1 requires a lot of learning the behavior of functions. And if you already look at the graph, it kind of takes away that um, understanding aspect of what our concepts in Calculus 1 are doing to our graph. So that's one of the reasons that I say no graphing calculators, because I really want you to understand, based on the function itself and the, and the calculus concepts that we're doing, how does that affect the shape of the graph without you knowing already what the graph looks like. So. That's the reason for no graphing calculators.
just so that you really kind of understand what's happening. So if you don't have a graphing calculator, you don't have the graph, how do you determine if a function is one-to-one? -one? All we know is, okay, every output has exactly one input. So algebraically, how do you do that? We know that for n, any output, you're supposed to just get one input. So let's try a random one. So I'm just going to randomly pick um, a y value. Let's say let y equals 2. How many inputs do we get? So let's, that means if y equals 2, remember h of x is just a fancy name for y. So I'm going to have 2 equals x plus 1 over x minus 3. And how many inputs? So I want to solve for x. And so how do I do that? Oh, my minus. So multiply both sides by x minus 3. So I'm going to have 2 times x minus 3 equals x plus 1. Distribute that 2. So I get 2x minus 6 is x plus 1. So subtract x and add 6. So I'm going to have x equals 7. So for the output 2, I only got one x value, one input 7. Is that going to work for any y value, do you think? And I'm tempted to say yes, right? The only time you're really going to run into a problem is when you're doing this, if you end up with a square or something, an even power, right? Because then you're going to, if, you, if it's a square, like we did with x squared, right? When you take the square root, you get plus or minus. Same thing if you end up having to take a fourth root or a sixth root, you're going to end up with a plus or minus. So those plus or minus are what, what are causing you to have multiple inputs. So in this case, I don't, I really just, I'm solving a linear equation, so everything is going to be one-to-one. -one. So it appears that it will be one-to-one. -one. You can um, try to do it more generally for um, any y. So let's say for any y1. And I just use y1 because oftentimes we use um, x1, y1 as random points on a graph, right? So I'm just using y1. So you will have y1 equals x plus 1 over x minus 3. But notice that the solving of this is going to be, be very similar to this, essentially. It's going to look, we're going to solve it the exact same way. So I'm going to say that, yes, h of x is 1 to 1. Essentially, you're looking for, do you get a plus or minus when you're solving for x? And you won't. In this case, you'll always be solving a linear once you multiply both sides by that. Now, how do we find the inverse? Now that I know it's one-to-one, -one, it says find the inverse. So let's find the inverse. Okay, so we know it is one-to-one. -one. By the way, what's the domain of h of x? It has a denominator, so x minus 3 can't be 0, right? Which means x can't be 3. So the domain will be minus infinity of 3, union 3 to infinity. So we have our domain. Um, all right, to find the inverse, kind of got sidetracked there with domain. But there is, I do have a point when we once we find the inverse. So we're going to let y equal x plus 1 over x minus 3. And then we switch the x and y. So that means we're going to have x equals y plus 1 over y minus 3. And then you solve for y. How do you solve for y? Just the way, actually, the same way that we solved for the x here. So multiply both sides by y minus 3. So I'm going to have x times y minus 3 equals y plus 1. Distribute the x. So I'm going to have xy minus 3x equals y plus 1. My goal is to solve for y. So you keep track of that goal. So that means you want to get the y's on the same side, everything else on the other. So I'm going to subtract y and add 3x. And now I'll notice that I have y on this side. So they're not like terms, right? I have x and a constant there, 1. But 
they both have y, so we're going to factor the y out. So I'm going to have y times x minus 1 equals 3x plus 1. And now I can get the y all by itself. Divide both sides by x minus 1. And so this will be the inverse, which I was calling it f, but it's really h, right? So this will be h inverse of x. h inverse of x is 3x plus 1 over x minus 1. And what's the domain of this one? The domain, again, we have a denominator, so x minus 1 can't be 0, which means x can't be 1. So the domain of the inverse then is minus infinity to positive 1, union 1 to infinity. Now, I did say I was going to come back and talk about the domain of h. Now, remember that what is the relationship between the function and its inverse? Way back when, at the beginning, in the first video, we said that right, the the x's and y switch places. So where was that? The very beginning. So when you have f, or in our case over there, h, you have the domain, and f takes that to the range. The inverse, now the range has become the domain, right? So this is really huge because when we're trying to find the range of a function, sometimes it may be really hard to see what the range is. When we did exponentials, it was easy to see because we can graph them fairly easy. But with something like this, h of x, you can't really graph it without using a graphing calculator. So I know the domain, but how do I tell the range? Well, now with the use of inverses, I can say, oh, the domain of my original function is the range, or sorry, the range of my original function is the domain of the inverse. So back to h of x, which was x plus 1 over x minus 3. Based on this work, we can say the domain of h is, we already know that one, it was minus infinity to 3 union 3 to infinity. But because of the domain of our inverse, now I can say the range of h of x is equal to the domain of the inverse function. And again, that's because the x's and the y's switch places. So what is the domain of this? Minus infinity to 1, union 1 to infinity. So now, what did I just find? I found the domain of h of x is this and the range of h of x is this. So now I don't need a graph to be able to find the range of a function. I can just find its inverse. The domain of the inverse is the range of the original function. Right, so I'll end there. In our next video, we're going to do the inverses of trig functions.